Hello, everyone, and welcome to We Can Build a Different World, a weekly series of events exploring abolition and mutual aid in the UK. Thank you so much for being here and joining us all at this final event in the series. My name is Leila Roxanne Hill, and I'm going to be tonight's host. And tonight's event is Imagining New Worlds, and we have a great collection of speakers gathered tonight to talk about creative practice and contemporary culture as a part of practices of abolition and as a pathway to not imagining, but building new worlds. A little bit of housekeeping. Our speakers will be giving us a brief five minute intro and then we'll go into discussion. This event series has been organized as a collaboration between Decriminalised Futures, Abolitionist Futures and Versal Books. Decriminalised Futures is a collaborative project using creative tools and popular education to explore sex workers' lives experiences and movement struggles. This year, they've been working with 13 artists, creating 10 different artworks, preparing for an exhibition that will be shown at the ICA early next year. These works are designed as responses to Swarm's audio archive, featuring discussions on migration, transfeminist activism, healthcare, austerity, and criminalization. All of these recordings are available on the Decrim Futures websites. Sorry, website. <laughs> They also run a monthly reading group, which you can sign up for. And next year, we'll be running a year long series of storytelling workshops, primarily for sex workers. Abolitionist Futures is a network of community organizers and activists in Britain and Ireland, working together to build a future without prisons, police and punishment. All year, they've been running an abolitionist reading group and the reading lists for, for these are all up on their website. And even if you can't make the reading groups, um, they're worth checking out. They've also recently started work with a bunch of other groups and organisers to create some resources about steps towards defunding the police, looking at reformist reforms versus abolitionist steps forwards for UK policing. It's a really useful and important resource that anyone interested in UK abolition should go and look at. The session tonight will be recorded and we'll send out links about all these organising groups when we send out a link to the recording. We'll also be sending out a list of the various resources and groups mentioned throughout the call. So we'll have those links for you and don't stress if you don't quite catch a reference. You know what it's like when people are talking. All the events from the series will be available on the Decriminalised Futures website in the next month or so, along with transcripts and resources. This event series is also supported by Versal Books, so a shout out to them for lending their platform and supporting grassroots abolitionist work. Also, thank you to Arika for their support in making this event series happen. Most importantly, we really hope that you enjoy tonight's event. Um, I'm your host for tonight. I'm Leo Roxanne Hill, and I'm a writer, curator and organiser who's based in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, a lot of the work that I do is focused on black lives in Scotland and looking at alternative ways of living, being, creating that exist outside of our capitalist system and much more. Um, without further ado, and going to introduce, we're going to allow the guests to introduce themselves. And um, so we'll be hearing firstly from Caleb. Caleb, you're muted. Hey, can you hear me? Um, my name is Caleb Brooks. I am a artist, um, a painter, performer, uh, videographer, printmaker, mostly looking at black trans experiences, um, black, black diasporic experiences, and all of those intersections. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Did you did you hear what I said? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we heard your intro. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Um, and if we can hear from Morgan next. Hi. Um, so I am Morgan M. Page. I'm a writer, artist, and historian, and an activist. Uh, I'm Canadian, but currently based in the UK. I, um, a lot of my work revolves around um, activist and community history. 
directories, particularly through my podcast, which you may have heard of, uh, called One from the Vaults, the podcast that brings you all of the dirt, gossip, and glamour from trans history. Um, I'm also the co-writer of the upcoming feature film, Framing Agnes, um, which takes a look at the construction of gender identity clinics um, through some really fascinating case files from the 1950s. Um, and I guess I'm sort of coming to this conversation um, as I do to my art from a background in um, activism around sex work, HIV and trans issues um, from an abolitionist perspective. And, um, you know, just to kind of frame that out a little, like for me, abolition is fundamentally about changing our relationships to each other and um, also to the earth to create a world in which there is no need for violence, prisons and punishment. So that's me. Amazing, thank you, Morgan. Um, and if we can hear from Francesca now. Hi everyone, my name is Francesca Sabandi and I'm a writer, researcher and lecturer in digital media studies at the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University. So I'm currently based in Cardiff, Wales, but spent most of my life in Scotland. And a lot of my work really focuses on the experiences of black people in Britain, in particular within devolved nations and different issues to do with creative work, labor, digital culture, and the various ways that people are imagining different futures. I'm really looking forward to being in conversation with everyone today. And I'm hopeful that what we have to speak about will be helpful as we all work towards a better future for everyone and not just a select few. Thank you, Francesca. And if you can hear from Cody now. Um, yeah, hi, um, I'm Corey. Uh, I'm an artist, a dancer and a writer. Um, I'm also a community health advocate and a mutual aid worker in the United States. I do a lot of harm reduction stuff. Um, yeah, um, I don't talk about myself much, sorry. Uh, I, with my writing, I work a lot in indigenous futurisms and with uh, um, other uh, Indigenous folks in so-called United States. Um, yeah, I'm excited to have conversations with everyone about our futures and creating futures and all that stuff. Thank you so much, Cody. And finally, Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle. Um, I'm mainly an artist and game designer. Um, I make work that really hopes to center black trans people and hope to create archives that will store us for the future. I mainly use uh, online and digital media to do this. Um, and so I've created archives like blacktransarchive.com. Um, yeah, that's me. Thanks so much for the introductions. I'm sure you'll agree we're going to be drawing and learning from a wide range of knowledges, experiences. Um, from all over the world and from various perspectives. So we are going to like move into some questions um, firstly, and we'd like to ask all of you this. Many of you create work that looks into histories of black and or trans life, and that often takes inspiration from political struggles or community formations. Um, when looking to the past, what are you searching for and what are you finding? And also, what do you feel that the archive or memory can offer us when we're trying to imagine a different world? And just anybody can step into that question. That I must step in. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the archive has failed us. It has been a huge failure. Um, and the way that uh, trans people are archived doesn't store us for an extended amount of time. So we're often lost to the archive. And so for me, it's really necessary for us to think about the alternative ways that we can archive ourselves and how we can find a system that will eventually end up recording us and not helping to erase us. That's what I think about there. Um, and I often look, look at the past and think about those that I wish that I could see and wish that, that I could remember. Um, because there's a, such a huge gap in the presence of black trans people 
Um, looking into the past, um, often I often like dream about the ancestors we had and the places that um, we were and how we did exist. And the fact that we've lost that all and we can't recuperate that um, is something that features a lot in my work. Um, and I'm kind of losing my train of thought, sorry. But <laughs> yeah, I'll stop there, of course. Thanks, Daniel. I'll, I'll chime in unless somebody else was about to speak. Um, yeah, I, I, I com completely agree about the, the violence of many archives. And I guess for me, when I'm looking to the past, I'm often seeking to understand and learn more about how people have collectively attempted to challenge intersecting forms of oppression for, for decades, for centuries, but how people have also worked together in ways that really centered care and community and also often involved overlooked moments of joy as well, that I think very much can become erased. And I think for me, the work of people such as Aziza Johnson and Mariam Jamila has really shaped how I think about what an archive can be. So thinking about the different ways that memory making and archiving can push against the, the violence of how um, you know, the state or institutions have attempted to sort of catalogue and categorise people's experiences with a lot of harm. And I think oftentimes archives are associated with the physical space. And actually for me, and I think in particular drawing on black feminist praxis, archiving can be about the everyday quotidian moments and archives can be living, they can be embodied. And I think collective archival work and memory work can offer really creative accounts of experiences and lives and political struggles in ways that treat them with the care that they deserve and really foreground vital community centered knowledge that is ultimately key to imagining a different world. Thank you. And would anybody else like to step into that question or like me to repeat it? Uh, yeah, I think one thing that made me start looking into the past was kind of this frustration with trans rights and like trans or LGBT rights being kind of the um, kind of like a in this like policy driven idea of progress. So then rather re recognize trans people as within this kind of continuum of history um, and as something that's like new and that hasn't been there for a long time, it kind of ends up being um, centering Western issues, for example, like gender neutral toilets, um, which is obviously important, but then you end up overshadowing things like um, the deaths of black trans women in Brazil. Um, so I think like that frustration kind of pushed me into looking at the fact that we've always been here. Um, and also kind of, I think how black trans deaths are used as a raw material to like push, push certain agendas and policies that don't actually end up affecting those that are experiencing the most violence. Um, yeah. I'm happy to jump in next. Um, you know, I agree so much with what everyone's saying. When I came to uh, looking at history, it was really um, because I didn't see any like trans women who were doing the kind of things that I was doing um, at all. And in particular, I stumbled across through like combing through the internet archive, old websites um, that detailed the work of Mira Ross, who's a um, Quebecois sex worker and performance artist in Canada. And it really uh, blew my mind that there was someone who was doing exactly the kind of work that I was doing. And I had like missed her like ships in the night. Um, for me, the work on the archive, as difficult as the archive is, is really about um, that it tells us that we're not alone and that our struggles are not isolated, that we stretch back through history, and that along the way our um, ancestors and predecessors have left uh, behind tools and solutions for the problems that we face right now. Um, so. You know, obviously we we gesture a lot as a community towards Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and other um, Stonewall veterans. But if we actually really took the time to look at their legacy, I think they leave us a lot more behind than we expect. Like, you know, for abolitionists, 
I think it's very significant that the first post Stonewall protest in New York City starts at the Women's House of Detention, where they protested in solidarity with um, women from the Black Panthers who had been detained, as well as lesbian and transmasculine people who were quite notoriously detained at that Women's House of Detention. So if we take Stonewall as kind of this moment of like, this is the beginning of like modern queer rights, then we can also see that abolition was there right from the start. Thanks, Morgan. Um, yeah, I want to pop in and thank everyone for all the things that they've said, because all of y'all are so smart. Um, I also want to uh, mention like the uh, history in general and archives in general are almost at this point all very much in almost exclusively created by um, uh, white peoples and colonizers and his, it, in the history of indigenous people, erasing trans people and queer people and gender variant people is a part of colonization and a part of white supremacy. Um, and when we're working with uh, archives and histories and queer histories, we're also working through the complicated like history of white supremacy um, intentionally wanting to erase um, brown bodies and queer bodies and all of our, who we are, which I feel like everyone, what people have said, like everyone is very aware and present with that. And that's part of the reason why um, documenting our own histories and our, having our own archives can be very important. Um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, and I feel that, you know, it's, we always go in search of answers and sometimes like where those answers might be aren't held like in the safest of places and i think that's just touching upon like the violence that we we've spoken about before but in looking at how we can make what we're experiencing and living through now accessible to those that will, that will come after us you know in ways that don't feel violent and that feel enjoyable that you can experience you know that people are going to experience joy from our own archives i think it's quite important for us to do that and like you know I guess it's that breaking down what an archive seems like. And one of the books that I remember reading a few years ago um, called Remnants, um, which is the story of it's the story of Rosemary Freeney Harding, and it's her daughter Rachel Elizabeth Harding who basically drew upon her mother's journals, lots of writing, like kind of family photos and hours of taped conversations and created like this wonderful book which is you know just a beauty um, a beautiful sort of testament to her activism her social work her organizing and her involvement you know in the civil rights movement and that's sort of like a yeah a more accessible archive um and just thinking how we can replicate that or create things that when you know people are looking to see what we were getting up to in 2020 yeah you know, like this amazing year and um, that there's joy that's experienced from it and the beauty can be seen in it too. Um, so we'll move on to a, another question and it's just how important is it that we put ourselves and our experiences in our work or see ourselves reflected in contemporary culture? Um, is there anything special in thinking through a trans imaginary or a black imaginary or a queer imaginary or an indigenous imaginary? Um, and this time I'm going to be quite firm and just randomly pick someone to answer the question. So we'll go for Danielle. Wow, Put me right on the spot right there. Um, it's weird because I don't think, it's weird because we're not, we're not special. We're not special people. We're people that haven't been given the opportunity to be heard. And so it feels weird to say that um, we put ourselves on a pedestal in order that um, that we have something that others don't. Like we do, we have an experience that no one else wants to recognize. Um, and we, we are unable to center ourselves often or given the opportunities in order to retell our stories in the way that we want. 
So seeing ourselves in contemporary culture seems like an amazing thing because before we have been quashed and silenced. And so having these platforms, having these building blocks from the past reach a point that to um, enable us to actually be on, um, be centered and be front and center, or front and center, be centered, and be allowed to say what we want to say and be allowed to point the fingers at people that we love and care about and to be heard and listened to and taken seriously, it feels incredibly special to see that. But it feels sad at the same time to, um, to be only pointing at the few and, and um, knowing that most of our communities are communities and are um, groups of people that hold us together, that allow us to reach this part of our lives. Um, and that's what I feel often is lost in this kind of like contemporary view of transness of trans people is that we often get these one, two, three people um, held up and seen as like great people to archive when actually there's a lot of people, a lot of our communities that are holding so much of us and aren't doing anything that they want to um, record in an artistic manner or record in a, or record in any way they have just been there and offer unconditional and continuous support. Um, there's something I call the sisterhood pot, which is about the, um, trans people um, giving and taking um, as much as possible and always having the, um, the energy to give back to each other as well as to receive from each other when they need that. And that's something that I feel like is, I, I want to see in contemporary media, I want to see that we are not one, we are not monoliths, we are single groups of people that enable us to get to the points that we need to get to. Um, and I've spoken so much and I've kind of forgotten the question. Um, but uh, in terms of, is there something special about the way we think? Yes, because nothing has been made for us. When thinking about technology, and I think about it a lot, none of us are in the coding language. None of us are in the admin teams. None of us are behind the, C uh, are the CEOs or of these companies. None of us hold the rights to make the Facebook groups. Um, and so eventually, all of these things, um, which aren't controlled by us and we're not in, will, will eventually happily erase us. And so I feel like um, having our thoughts, the way that we think, be ingrained within projects, be ingrained within um, developing new ideas of thinking and new practices and new ideas of archiving is special because we have been out of the picture for so long that when we're in there, the questions that have been missed and misguided are suddenly brought to the forefront and answered. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I wanted to add to what you were saying about, I guess, like erasure and in invisibility. I was like recently revisiting the writing around the 2017 Whitney Biennale. Um, I don't know if you all remember, but basically like a white artist named Dana Schutz um, had a painting feature called Open Casket, which was a graphic painting of Emma Till's um, casket open. Um, and you know, it kind of brings up these questions of like, who is allowed to tell what stories and who has access to tell what stories and do we have the resources to tell our own stories? Um, also like Raina, Raina Gossett, um, black trans woman whose um, script was stolen by Netflix for the Marsha P. Johnson documentary. Um, so I feel like it's this weird space where like, there's suddenly this feeling of visibility, um, but with that visi visibility comes also like, a commodification of our identities. Um, so, so many people and so many brands and networks are trying to like, I feel like co-opt that. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's incredibly important. And I'm, I'm also thinking about like, I had a, um, a, a friend quite like a, you know, not a super close friend, but a friend commit suicide um, a few months ago who was like hyper, hyper visible, a black trans guy who was hyper, hyper visible on um, Instagram. And it's like, okay, we have, you know, these quite iconic figures um, that supposedly, you know, have these platforms to access community that are incredibly important in making us feel good or making us feel seen. But then when you step outside, how much of that, you know, visibility on social media and these type of things is actually translating to the public? And does, does that matter? Um, is that where, sh should, where we should be investing? Um, I think particularly with like 
I mean, with my work, I think I look more into, I guess, like a black imaginary um, and kind of like taking these fragments and piecing them together and creating myths um, because there's so many like fragmented pieces that I think we need to kind of like make sense of to like kind of understand what we were talking about before, like the archive and like our, our histories. Um, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but. No, I think it's really important that you've raised like the dangers that come like with that visibility and even, you know, something like this, you know, there's there's a danger that comes like with that visibility and speaking and just how much of that becomes like for consumption of, you know, the world that we're trying to break free from, you know, does that both help us create like the new worlds or the imagined, imagined worlds that we're looking for? Or is it just contributing to and giving more content to the worlds that we're trying to break away from? Now, Francesca, I know that some of your work, you know, particularly looks at the digital experiences and digital lives of black women um, in the UK. So maybe you could speak a little bit to this too. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I just want to echo all of what's already been said. And I think something I was thinking about whilst everyone was speaking, which again has already been expressed, um, but I was reflecting on the work of um, Ruha Benjamin on race after technology. And I think I might be sort of paraphrasing here, but there's a really great part to do with the fact that economic recognition does not result in you know, the redistribution of power and resources or the dismantling of um, structures that oppress people. And I think what we're speaking about today and when we're thinking about seeing individuals reflected in contemporary culture and seeing people who have been so structurally oppressed for so long and, um, you know, represented in different sometimes commercial contexts, there is this real risk whereby we find that the experiences of those people are um, ultimately commodified or co-opted and, and those people are treated in really awful ways um, which can ultimately help commercial entities to, to maximise their profit. So, you know, the examples that people have already spoken about, the, the work and labour conditions that people might experience or the way that their, their work is stolen or the way that they might be exploited. I think there are so many um, challenges and tensions here when we're speaking about issues to do with representation and even with the term, I think, contemporary culture, you know, which aspects of culture or, or whose culture or if we're speaking about what's referred to as mainstream culture, you know, are we really speaking about culture that foregrounds um, whiteness? And, and if so, what does it mean to find people? And um, in, in, in my own work, it particularly focuses on the experiences of black people. But what does it mean for people to find that their experiences are re reflected um, or are represented by people who live very different lives to them and whose gaze is sometimes much more extractive than it is supportive or helpful in any way? Thanks, Francesca. And Morgan or Cody, would you like to come in on this? Oh my gosh, I, I have so many like feelings and like every, all of everyone's statements have just like brought up more ideas and whatnot. Um, I feel like with um, when we're talking about contemporary culture, we all like um, Francesca said like we it helps to define what that means. Um, uh, particularly, like, um, uh, are we talking about um, contemporary culture in a specific country, um, internationally, um, as far as in, in relation to, um, like, uh, popular media or music? Um, because when we're talking about seeing our own stories represented in, uh, in culture, that can mean a lot of different things, and just depending on uh, people's different cultural backgrounds are going to get drastically different things out of different um, supposedly mainstream um, uh, media. Um, and uh, what does that look like for all of us in general? I don't know. Sorry. I started, I also sort of lost my train of thought there. Um. I, get, I would really agree with Danielle and Caleb that um, visibility is a trap, that it doesn't measure safety, but how consumable we are to capitalism. Um, but for me, like to go to the second part of this, of the original question of this, um, 
you know, I don't really care so much about like mainstream culture, um, uh, except as a person who obviously exists in it and consumes it as well as anyone else does. But I think there is immense value in trans people um, thinking, dreaming, and creating things together. So that's more where I spend my time, whether it's like, you know, through the podcast world or as activists or um, working on films. Uh, I'm really only interested in speaking with and about and to trans people. Um, so that's me. Everybody's um, train of thoughts were all beautiful, irrespective of whether you felt that they disappeared off. But I think that's the thing, like the dominant culture, however we want to read that, is always going to find parts of non-dominant culture to take from and then present back. So we probably sh maybe shouldn't be chasing after that or trying to find like the representation there you know and really like making it for us and by us and not feeling that anything that's private or sacred or special has to be like shared like on a you know on a consumption basis because that's you know that is like what we're living in at the moment but i don't know if there's anything else that anybody would like to add to those to that or yeah like just looking at people on the panel, like I feel that that's what we do, um, and that I most of us I think have started our work not getting paid um, and not actually making any money and putting on a a mainstream platform like maybe like Instagram because that was the easiest, freest, most accessible channel for us to do, and we know we had friends there that reflected us, and so we we're like, right, I want to show you this. I can just put it on my Instagram, and you can see it. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I just want to like, it was just nice what Morgan said in terms of like recentering us in the conversation and recentering um, that um, our only interest actually, at least, yeah, I just echo that. Well, my only interest is also like black trans people. Like I'm not really interested in making anything palatable, educational, or uh, in this kind of like trans tourism thing. It's about making the work for us um and sometimes that that sucks because we don't have the money to actually make what we want to or to um do it on the scope that we want to and like pay people to be involved and all this stuff um but i feel that's like a really important thing to hold on to when thinking about contemporary culture is because um that kind of culture doesn't uplift the communities it only uplifts one person and so when you're making work for a community often it's not work to um be consumed by anyone other than that community and um yeah i feel like i just wanted to echo and talk on that bit thank you danielle i think just even touching upon that and you know we've said like how important it is that we put ourselves but i think also like where we put ourselves and you know there's a lot of you know our commonalities here as well as like around digital you know that we're finding ourselves especially more so now you know on youtube on twitter so it's just like so where can we put that stuff that doesn't exist like say on youtube or on twitter you know and how can it still be for us by us without you know getting caught up in the fact that it's still essentially owned you know by youtube twitter facebook TikTok, you know all the the big brands and even you know podcasts and books and stuff as well just we thought I had to and we're saying how but just where we put ourselves if anyone wants to come in on that I mean like they've purposely made yeah. it oh, oh, Sorry. go ahead <laughs> okay I'll be brief um but I think you know it's no wonder that we're all caught up in um, being on these platforms, even right now as we speak on this panel, like they've made it impossible for there to be a world that's not consumable by the mainstream and by capitalism ultimately. The internet of the 90s doesn't exist anymore. And even that was still, you know, part of it. But um, I think it's all the more reason why we need to be really uh, careful and cautious with how, or more careful and more cautious with how we approach uh, 
these platforms and in particular the ways that they begin to shape and limit um, the things that we're able to make to and for each other and with each other, right? Because a lot of the uh, platforms are bringing in really strong anti-sex work um, legislation from the United States that makes it impossible for certain bodies to exist on social media or certain body parts um, that makes it um, possible to shadow ban people who associate with or are assumed to be sex workers. Um, so I think, yeah, we just need to be really, I think we need to be thinking about how we can make spaces outside of that, um, and particularly in-person spaces, unrecorded spaces. Okay, Francesca, you're going to say something. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I just very much agree with, with, with everything that's been said. And yeah, I think I was just going to once more pause and reflect on the fact that it's tricky because, you know, in, in some ways there are certain digital spaces or platforms or, or aspects of digital culture that can afford people the chance to create and share and connect with other people in ways that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. But yeah, I think um, at the same time, we sometimes see sort of digital space or what people are saying or doing online and um, being regarded as though it's the the only the only example of um you know how people are organizing or how people are creating or how people are, are trying to work together and, and imagine different futures so i think that especially at a time right like right now when there's even more of a focus on um the online and what people are are posting on Twitter or, or what people are, are posting on Instagram. I think that it's really important that at the same time, we don't forget about the fact that just because something isn't visible in a digital space doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And I think that connects back to archiving as well. And it's just thinking about the fact that, you know, archiving, memory making, doing this sort of work, it's not always visible or it's not always visible in the same ways to, to, to the same groups of people. But just because we haven't heard about it online um, doesn't mean that something isn't happening. And, and actually, sometimes some of the most exciting and grassroots work isn't visible to, to the people who are logging in right now to a social media platform. Thanks, Francesca. Yeah. Um, it also makes me think a little bit about, or a lot of bit about the, like the gallery space and like, Danielle, kind of what you were saying, like, you know, making work specifically for an audience that looks like you, black people, trans people, um, and how comfortable those people feel in those spaces and like how to disrupt the spaces that we already have access to. Um, there's a performance that I do where it's basically like a mixture of uh, poetry, repetition, costume. And I try to go into this like trans transcendental space um, where I'm talking about black trans death um, and literal death, but also um, like social death as well. And there's a part where I'm like, you know, walking up to people in, you know, gallery types like suits and ties um, and shouting in their faces, asking them if they're supposed to be there. Um, so I also think, I mean, it's, it's quite nice as well, like seeing, I don't know, I guess the shock <laughs> for the first time, like having someone's comfortability in a space disrupted and kind of like shifting them more into, um, or shifting them to engage really um, with like black trans experiences. Um, yeah, so I'm also interested in that as well, kind of subvert, subverting through um, artwork in those type of spaces. And just a wee reminder for our audience that if you want to ask any questions, that was a totally Scottish trope there, wasn't it? Same wee. Um, if you want to ask any questions, there's a Google form, um, the links um, below the video and you can ask um, any of the panelists any questions via that, via that format. Um, so the next question actually comes from a question that was asked during the first panel in this series event, uh, series, series event which is Abolition in the UK. Um, it seems relevant to return to it now. Just what supports and helps you create spaces for imagination, which you know, we've touched upon a little bit, like in previous questions. But maybe if we can go a little bit more, go a little bit deeper into that, 
and how do we think outside of or beyond or through our current structures in abolitionist spaces? Um, and maybe just talk a little bit more, we've touched again upon on technology and imagination and how creative work is not just about creating art, but just our lived practice and any other community or political work that um, you're involved in. So I think we'll go for, we'll go for Corey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, as far this, this is like a big question because I've been thinking a lot about um, my communities and community support lately. Um, and I'm I'm lucky enough that I have a very supportive um, community of, of sex workers and harm reductionists in Seattle right now, which has not been the case in the past. Um, I work very closely with uh, Greenlight Project, um, which is a sex worker mutual aid um, group. And uh, yeah, it was started by a black trans person and uh, it's a constant, the people involved in that group is, are always a constant source of inspiration and uh, support. Um, uh, I'm also lucky enough to have a network of uh, Indigenous creatives, um, both uh, in North America, uh, Turtle Island, and internationally, who are an, an amazing amount of support because Indigenous people are almost always, if not um, using the same language around abolition and whatnot, they're doing it and creating worlds and creating um, spaces and art that uh, um, promotes that. Because um, the folks who've um, dealt with uh, colonization and genocide for generations now. So um, talking about uh, mutual aid and community support and uh, all of, and abolition is uh, something that people have been doing for a very, very long time um, and is also considered part of traditional practice. So yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Cody. Um, would anybody else like to come in on this big question? What supports and helps you create spaces for imagination and how do we think outside of or beyond or through our current structures into abolitionist spaces? And if you want to reflect on technology, creativity, whatever you want, run with it. Right, maybe we should have, I don't know, this one is a weird one because I feel like everyone, we've, oh God, um, I hate when it zooms in on my face. Um, I feel like we have got here um, from such different ways um, of like working and thinking and like dreaming. Um, and maybe, at least for me, I, I never think, thought I would be here. I didn't think it would was possible um you know like I'm a mother now um I make video games like I just didn't think that was possible um and what made me I don't know the spaces that allowed that to happen um it's weird a lot of them if I'm being honest were like club spaces full of black trans people um, full of trans people full of like a community that would only come out at night um, because during the day we were trying to make money um, and trying to work or trying to learn. Um, and it feels, I could like just pinpoint artists, but it, like I don't really want to do that. Like I don't really want to do that anymore. Like it feels a bit, it feels easy for someone to go and research um, a bunch of artists for us to throw out. And I'm not really interested in doing that for myself. I'm much more interested in actually um, like shouting out the groups of people, like events like Babes that Babes put on, um, that like Pussy Palace and things like this. These are London based. Um, spaces like Oyun in um, Berlin, um, that they allow for a kind of um, meeting point to happen that isn't under something like this, which I find very restrictive but instead under like our terms and, and not really talking for anyone, but like really trying to like say like, I, I want this to happen. Um, and having so many ideas and so many th thoughts that 
are great, but never came to fruition because funding, money, time, um, and mental health. And so, um, I don't know, I, feel, I just, I feel like it's a bit of a, I don't know, I sound like, sound like bleh. Um, but yeah, it, it just feels, it feels like a bit of a weird one because I just, I, I kind of want to know how you, everyone else here got to where they are. I kind of want to know um, who helped you along the way. Like I know for me, um, it was my, my best friend who, who even introduced me to being who I am and, and loving that and having the possibility to dream and thinking that that would be accepted um, and not taking anything less and being my truth the entire time. And so for me, it took one person to say that for me to dive into it um, and to continue doing it and to work four or five jobs at once and still have hold on to that dream. Um, yeah, and so I'm, I don't know, for me, I'm so interested in you lot. I, I like, you lot are literally tangibly right here and you are like the best resource for, for me to pull from. So I'm like, hey, like you are like the, some of the, some, you are literally a part of the community. You're right here, right in front of me. Like, I don't know why I would not be saying you're so interesting. I need to learn from you and hear how you lot got to how, where you are and who helped you. I sound like an absolute blur, but. <laughs> yeah, absolutely don't. Like that's, you've just done like my job, which is amazing. So yeah, like would people like to answer like those questions? Like how are we here? How are we known to be here? And who, what helped us and helps us be here? Doing what we do. Um, I can say something. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. I, it makes me think a lot about, I guess, like resourcefulness. I think there were so many times that I just had to help myself, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I got kicked out quite early. So, uh, just experiencing like chronic homelessness and seeking out, um, squats and living situations and I mean yeah black queer squats in Chicago um squats in London a lot of a lot of squatting um and then kind of finding those um which was which was also actually really difficult in a lot of ways because I was in a lot of like anarcho punk spaces which are now quite um trans inclusive but you know 10 years ago 15 years ago weren't at all um and yeah, other other queer people, other trans people. Um, I was even like thinking about like, you know, with creating creating futures or an imaginary. I was thinking about like the resourcefulness um, that we've seen like during COVID. Uh, like, I'm a part of a QDB pot mutual aid group, um, and just seeing like how quickly people were able to organize food and essentials um, to people that were immunocompromised um, or couldn't leave their house and. I think a part of that comes from like the expectation that, you know, we are each other's family and also that the state isn't gonna be there um, to support you. And, you know, thinking about like, you know, we were like really talking about the apocalypse. Like we, we were all in the apocalypse, but then like in that moment, I think people were like, okay, like what are my, what are my skills um, and how can I apply them and how can I share them? And, you know, I was thinking, I was like, all right, I can like fish and hunt and shoot, but like, do I know how to mediate? Uh, like what, like what is like transformative justice? Like how, um, so yeah, I, I think like, yeah, skill sharing and resourcefulness and being innovative as a community. I think we're some of the most innovative magical people ever because we've had to survive and a lot of us haven't survived, you know? So um, it's, uh, yeah. Ooh, do I need to pick someone? Um. I'll, I'll, I'll add something. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think when when the, when you first asked the question, um, a few things that immediately came to mind mind were 
time and rest and resources, which again, everybody's already spoken about. And I think that there are real, um, there's a real contrast between who often has the time to do certain types of work um, or who has the um, resources and the, the financial um, wealth or material conditions to afford them the ability to, to work in certain ways that doesn't require them, you know, having several different jobs at the same time. And yeah, I think that right now, when we look at some of the different ways that people have been speaking about their experience of lockdown or their experience of 2020, it's so clear that there are real differences between people who have enjoyed a lot of free time and with friends and family, have um, spoken about a lot of rest that they've got, have not been fearful of the many different crises that are impacting people in so many different ways. And then the experiences of others who are involved in mutual aid work, who are coming together collectively, but in ways that can be very exhausting for them and very demanding. So I think that you know time, rest and, and resources are so important in allowing people to be able to do the sort of collective work that is gonna be crucial to working towards a different future. And I was just thinking about some of the brilliant groups that I'm aware of and just really thankful for the sort of stuff that they do. So I know in recent months, seeing the Free Black University making use of digital spaces and technology in a way that is really um, pushing forward the redistribution of knowledge and resources and the recognition of the um, knowledge of, of, of many different Black people who more often than not are dismissed and um, disregarded within sort of formal and educational environments and thinking about um, Healing Justice London and the brilliant stuff that they're making available online, which really focuses on, again, care and um, healing, he healing during everything that is going on, not just COVID related, anti-blackness and um, different struggles that people are facing in different parts of the world. And when I was thinking about some of my own experiences of, of leaving Scotland and living briefly in England before moving to Wales, I was really thankful for the work of everybody involved in Rooted Zine, um, which focuses on the creative and lived experiences of people of colour in, in the northwest of England. And it's been really brilliant to just see all that everybody involved in that has been doing, both online and offline. And I remember feeling so um, welcomed and heartened to be a part of some of the in-person things that they organised whilst I lived there. So I think just, you know, when I reflect on all those different groups and the work that they're doing, I'm so conscious that more often than not, the people who are leading these 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 projects, who are, who are doing this sort of work, really are facing the worst forms of oppression and really are often doing work in ways that can involve a lot of risk and harm. So whilst I'm here saying I'm appreciative of all that people are doing, I also want to recognise the fact that um, that can come at a real cost. And I think that there are always more ways that people can be trying to think about how we can support those who are on the ground doing the work that many people speak about being interested in, but don't actually do themselves. Thanks, Francesca. Um, and would anybody else like to come in on just some of the some of the ideas that have surfaced like through this one big question? Um, well, first to answer Danielle's sort of challenge to us to kind of name the people um, who've gotten us where we are. You know, I mentioned before Mia Sole Ross, who I don't think I would uh, I would exist without. Um, uh, but also I think a lot about the dead and about um, uh, particularly friends who've died, who've really uh, created worlds for me, like um, the trans woman writer, Bryn Kelly, um, and uh, the kind of legendary Canadian sex work activist, Wendy Babcock. Um, and then to kind of go back to the main question, um, uh, you know, what I think about when I heard this question was um, that whatever we create, um, structures, worlds, futures, um, as abolitionists, it has to be better and more accountable than the things they are meant to replace. Um, and I know that sounds really um, like obvious, but you would be surprised how many people hop on into abolition and don't realize that they are reproducing the same structure that in theory they want to get rid of. 
Um, and I think that's the really, the really hard work of abolition is pulling apart the pieces within ourselves so that we can see when we are just reproducing um, carceral logics in our lives and in our communities, even as we claim to be making new things, right? Um, so that's what comes up for me for that question. Thanks, Morgan. Cody? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I feel a bit scattered because people have gone in so many different uh, directions. But the, um, yeah, the question of who has helped get us here, um, so many different people from like the people that I currently work with who have helped support me for the last like several years and um, people in uh, also internationally as well. Um, uh, yeah, there's um, interestingly enough, I have found that there are not very many uh, like uh, sex work groups that have supported, at least in the US, it's very unusual for um, trans masculine people and indigenous people to be supported by um, other sex workers. Um, that's something that has been happening for me recently, which is new. Um, uh, also, I wanted to, um, what Morgan was saying about um, replacing uh, carceral structures and abolitionists, um, it make creating uh, stuff that's better than before that really spoke to me. Um, so that's something that I feel like if you have any, uh, any background of working with folks trying to do um, like abolitionist work or like create new worlds is that like oftentimes people end up recreating the wheel in really awkward and uncomfortable ways. And currently in the US, there's been an uprising going on for months and months and months. There's been at least two um, protests every day in Seattle for over 100 days. Um, we might be coming up on like 150, something like this, um, all around um, the value of Black lives and many, many, many different um, structural inequalities um, and through that people have been trying to have been grappling with ideas of uh, prison abolition and police abolition and a lot of things and some of the ways that people have been doing it have been um, more effective than others and in some ways have harmed people rather than hurt than helped um, yeah I feel like uh, addressing how we move forward and how we're creating new systems and futures is something super valuable. Thanks. So I think just to touch upon that, you know, the hardest work is, you know, folks can come in and they can be, yeah, I'm going to get behind the anti-racist movement. I'm going to, you know, start, start, throwing my support like behind sex workers rights trans rights you know and then it's just kind of the saying it and when it comes to challenging perhaps you know behaviors or actions or words that are reinforcing you know the same harms trying to get away from then it becomes you know quite a defensive and quite hard space like to work through and sometimes that's when we lose you know people and we lose support and it becomes like an even more isolating experience um, for everyone, you know, and I think it's like we end up moving further and further away as opposed to just trying to find like the, where we can exist, like in, you know, the, the new worlds or the reimagined or imagined worlds that we're trying to recreate. And I guess like that's something that we're seeing like with the language of mutual aid has become incredibly popular you know, and become quite a normalized, I don't really like using that word, but it's, you know, it's entered into like the realm and it's just like, you know, we're, we're all in this together, we're building back better. And there's no like real critique or understanding about what that looks like, apart from just taking 
this sort of yeah it's all going to be for everyone and that's it you know without like really like drilling it down and going no like we need to like just work hard um doesn't mean that there's yeah said before it doesn't mean that there's no time for like joy joyfulness and peacefulness but we find that when we come through the hard part I find and I think just in response to your um, challenge Danielle I think it, it all came from experience right and it's about who you are and how you present in the world and then how that presentation then comes back at you that sort of like I found for me it dictated like who was going to be in my life and where I was going to go and who what I was going to read what I was going to do like work behind and for and I'm always like quite reluctant to name people in this but just yeah to touch upon what Francesca said you know it's rest time and resources um which have come from like a lot of people like throughout the years and I'm so massively thankful to them even you know even if I don't have a relationship with them anymore but or if I never had a relationship with them and you know I've accessed like their knowledge like through different resources so yeah it's just worth thinking about and going off in Morgan's statement about um being more accountable how does the panel see that happening or you know where do you see your art practice um or you know your work being more accountable or like trying to promote accountability. Anyone can go. We've got the virtual call silence. I'll say something, and, <laughs> um, but, but I will keep it brief because um, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, although I, I definitely am um, involved in different forms of creative practice, I, 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 I wouldn't want to, um, I don't refer to myself as an artist, so I'm not going to speak to that. Um, but what I would say, I think, and again, you know, some of the different groups we've spoken about are doing this sort of work so well, is something that I'm always conscious of and learning more about from um, different br brilliant friends and, and people in my life is, you know, when we are um, creating together or producing knowledge, how can we share it in ways that go beyond just that one space? So whether that is, you know, recording something like this, or it's, you know, um, if there is a book that's for sale, are there places it can be open access? And then beyond that, if there are places where it's open access online, what about people who, who don't have access to the internet or who wouldn't be able to view it that way? So I think um, this maybe connects back to some of these questions to do with accountability and to do with the types of work we've been discussing but I think it's always thinking as expansively as possible in relation to the question of who is or isn't able to be a part of this or find out about this and I think even sometimes actually when it's sort of word of mouth within different um, spaces that are sometimes speaking to each other and doing really great things still sometimes there can be an element of unintentional um, gatekeeping or it might be that there, there are parts of a, a broader community that people want to be a part of what they're doing but they're not actually doing that work to ensure that they know what's going on so I think part of a, addressing accountability is, is thinking about how do people know what is happening and if they aren't aware of something that's going on we shouldn't always think that that's down to the individual to do the, the work to find out about it why is it visible to some people in some ways and not visible to others in, in different ways. Thanks, Francesca. Um, Caleb, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, um, I think something that comes to mind is like storytelling. Um, and I think in my work and a lot of our work, um, a lot of it has to do with offering opportunity to tell people stories. Um, so I think what comes with that is making sure people are seen in the ways that they wanna be seen. Um, for example, like I do these like very anthropic, these like um, paintings reimagining the Atlantic slave trade. Um, and then I, it's basically like half 
queer black people half um, creatures of the sea um, and people get to choose like which animal they want to be or which, who they feel most connected to and kind of like create their own myth um, through that connection to like a sea animal. Um, or um, I think also like recognizing that just because we might fall under like, you know, cutie BIPOC, for example, doesn't mean that we have the same lived experiences, um, which I think something, it often happens when we're trying to create spaces. I, I think everyone's life gets conflated. <laughs> um, and so I think also just like not, not moving within the spaces that we create for ourselves with assumptions about who people are and what they do or who they want to be or what the futures they want to create is. You know, we don't all have to have the same narrative if we want to create platforms for our narratives. Thanks, Caleb. Um, Corey, would you like to say anything on that? Uh, on the original, like, um, how we keep ourselves accountable. Um, um, gosh, that's like a very big question. And like, uh, I feel like, like, we could do like, like whole hours and panels of just on like what does that look like in our communities as as artists and as as community members and like as people trying to create another world like um, how do we remain accountable to ourselves and to our communities and our, our families whether they be blood related or chosen um, uh, for me one of the most important things about it is communicating it and that like I am attempting to be accountable for the things that I create in the world and for my own actions. Um, uh, as far as like translating that into like a larger, like how do we keep institutions um, accountable? That's a whole other mess that I, I don't, I, that would just take far too long to unpack right now, I think, yeah. Thanks, Cody. And yeah, I think you're right. That's definitely, we could have hours of accountability and how do we save institutions? Um, this event series has taken a lot of inspiration from the Ruthie Wilson Gilmore quote, abolition is building the future from the present in all the ways we can. Um, what are ways you think we can build the future and what type of future do you want to build? I think we've touched upon this a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm going to randomly pick um, somebody again and I think we'll go for Danielle. Hi, oh, I knew my time was coming up. Um, yeah, so going on accountability, like um, I also think about, okay, like what what are we missing? So for example, like this panel is missing a dark skinned black person. Um, and so we're missing that viewpoint, which seems like very important right now. And like taking into account the things that maybe we we don't have and aren't listening to because we, we didn't have them there. Um, but it's like, a, and in terms of, yeah, that's like, sorry, that's just something like I thought, like, um, I think is a good thing to do is just like pointing out, like you have the, these, uh, absences and how do we make sure those absences don't continue, you know? Um, and in terms of the other question, God, which I'm going to read from the side because I have completely forgotten it. Um, sorry. Accountability. I'm so sorry. Question. Oh, no, um, the, so the one that after one that is how can we build? How can we build the future? And what future do you want? Right. Yeah. Um, so I obviously want a future that centers Black trans people. I want a future that centers sex workers. I want a future that centers disabled people. I want a future that centers everyone that never had a voice before. Now that is obviously an imagination like i i dream of that um and it's something that we all dream of but um to get there um it requires an immense decentering of others other people um and um i think that's a sometimes we have these conversations and even these panels and we center others um and not ourselves or institutions without noticing noticing and we need to have those uh, uh, conversations yes but it's, it's so hard for us to even center ourselves 
and not fall into the trap of centering someone else or centering something um, that you don't have any influence in currently, um, rather than focusing on how to do that groundwork around you. And so for me, it would come out like a real, um, just personally for me, it would look at like, what can I personally do? Um, what things have, can I put my energy into? Um, and where do I see the absences and how can I fill that? And who can I ask to help me fill that? Um, because I feel like then you start to build these kind of collectives or these um, small groups, which um, maybe you maybe it's just started by you and you end up coming out of it, but something might really grow from that. Um, and it may help a small pocket of people, but that's just as good as you trying to think of the, the biggest ending and changing the whole world. Um, so yeah, I really think like these like, small, okay, I guess you can call them grassroots, but um, just like thinking locally first before um, in terms of your own connections, by which I mean, you have someone in another country that you know and checking in on them, making sure they're okay, setting up a service for them to get food if they can't leave their house. And things like that can really like grow and allow that person to think of the same things. Um, another thing that I'm just going to randomly bring up, um, it's not random, but um, it's a, the weird thing that I've been thinking about a lot is like GoFundMes and thinking about this climate of how we have uh, as trans people, if we need something that costs a lot of money, often it requires us to play the GoFundMe, GoFindMe game where we have to advertise and work, it's work, to make people donate us money for something that we absolutely need. And that's a future that cannot continue because although GoFundMe is good because you can get the money, it is not okay to um, make trans people have to go down this route and have to advertise what they want and are unable to live private lives because they have to work in advertisement for themselves so that they could live uh, the life they want to live. And that's something that, that we really need to like figure out, right, how do we stop living on the kindness of others and start living like the lives that we need to live? Thanks, Daniel. Um, Francesca, would you like to come in on this question? I mean, I, I feel like <laughs> that there's there's nothing more I have to add other than to yeah, just reiterate everything that has already been said. And um, I think what I was thinking about when you asked the question was conversations I've been having with people specifically to do with ableism and to do with the fact that you know earlier on in this year there were a few weeks when there was this it's not business as usual situation um, and you know beyond that people are still expecting people to produce things rapidly to be um, you know sort of functioning uh, as normal so to speak and I think that there's there, there are a lot of conversations right now to do with um, what is or isn't the new normal for different people in this time of lockdown, this time of COVID, this time of crisis. But what we're really not seeing nearly enough of is this push against the emphasis on productivity and, and the capitalism, ca capitalist structures that's a part of. Um, and the fact that so few people have had the, the time or the space to mourn, to grieve to be, to heal, to recover, um, and people are still mourning. And, and you know, we don't know what the long-term impact of this sort of delayed, um, you know, process of, of grieving and this lack of recognition of collective grief is, we don't know what that's gonna, gonna mean for people um, further down the line. So I just wanted to, to bring that up and again, just um, say everything that everybody else has said um, is, 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 is exactly how I feel about this too. Thanks, Francesca. Um, Morgan? Sure, yeah. I mean, when I think about um, building the future, like all of my political and artistic and literary work comes out of a desire to stop watching my friends die from poverty, violence, and systems of neglect, um, which has been a constant feature of my time on this earth is watching that cycle just happen again and again. So I really connect very strongly with what Danielle's talking about um, around GoFundMes and the way that like um, people are now having to hustle the fact that they um, don't 
have what they need to survive. And we're watching that play out in real time. I'm amazed by the, uh, not, not surprised, but like um, struck by the constancy of it. I mean, it's always been a constant in trans communities at least, and I'm sure in other really marginalized communities where people you know, used to throw rent parties to be able to pay the rent and that sort of thing. But now we're watching it on a scale that I don't think we've ever lain witness to as culture. Um, and so when I think about how I wanna build the future, it's really about the idea of getting to see my friends grow old um, because so few of them have had that opportunity and in all likelihood, so few of the ones who are still around will have that opportunity. So that's where I start from when I think about building a future. Let us grow old. <laughs> Um, Caleb, would you like to come in on re rebuilding or building new worlds? Um, yeah, I think something I'm really, really interested in um, is uh, autonomous land projects, um, actually imagining what community building like looks like in like literal space and like ownership over space, like for example, I don't know any like black trans owned spaces in London. Um, I don't I don't know if I know of any period <laughs> actually. Um, but I think, you know, a part of being able to create the futures that we want is to be able to have the space to do that. Um, also, as I said before, like, I mean, for, for my friends as well, I think homelessness is something that's completely rampant um, in the trans community and it's, obviously leads to experiences of violence, um, all, all sorts. Um, so I think, you know, creating opportunities for people to have um, housing so you can think, <laughs> you know, if you think about what you want to build, even think about what you want to create, think about, um, you know, or even think about what you want to destroy. I think before I feel like me personally to a degree and like loads of my friends can even get to that space. Um, it's, you know, existing in a space where you're not solely focused on your safety. Um, yeah. And Corey, if there's anything you'd like to add. Oh, I just want to tell y'all that you're all amazing and everyone's ideas of futures are really, really amazing. Uh, yeah, especially what you said, Morgan, about watching the friends go, go old, because I've also lived a life where I've had to bury many of my many of my people, and I would like to not have to do that anymore. And uh, as, like, uh, one of my biggest fantasies is also, of course, returning land to indigenous people for stewardship is what we have come to with uh, extraction-based capitalism has destroyed the planet to the point where we may not survive as a human species. Um, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you as well, Caleb, like, people are being able to have homes so they can think. Like, all of these things, um, all they, they all connect. Uh, I'll shut up now. Thanks, Cody. I think that's it, right? It's like we shouldn't have to ask or beg or steal, you know, just to be able to have a nice life, right? Um, and I think another project that I was involved with like last year, and we were talking about, you know, crowdfunders and GoFundMe, and that was, you know, more mainstream organization looking to like raise funds and we knew that it would get funded because you know their networks and their net you know and just like the ripple effect of networks that's still what we're saying like replicating the same structures that we're like existing and living within um, and then even just that publicly having to say that you need and then folks knowing how much you need and folks knowing that you have access to that money like there's a danger like in that too um which yeah just just a thought. Um, so to maybe go back to like a little bit of, you know, the work that we're doing and like 
art and making art and just a lot of ways um, art and making art can be a practice of experimenting. Um, how do you see this relating to how we create structural change and I think just to add to that like how important is being experimental um, or at least what's considered to be experimental and we will go for it's a lot of power like just going I'm going to decide um we'll go for Caleb So the, the question, sorry, I don't need to ask again. So the question is, how do how does experimenting in art um, allow us to see the futures that we want to see? Is that the, sorry, can you repeat it? I mean, that would do. Like, if that's the question okay. that you want to answer, like, <laughs> let's just answer that question. <laughs> um, hmm. I mean, I, I always think that there's something incredibly powerful about um, especially that when thinking of like memory um, and kind of what we were talking before about the archive kind of being able to visualize um, our memories and our history in a way that I think has been um, intentionally hidden from us. Um, so I feel like when it comes to like experimenting um, with this information, I think we allow kind of like a not only like a thread for like conversations and discussions but also like an understanding of where we come from so we have a better idea of like who we want to be and where we want to move um and i've seen like such incredible work i mean even you know looking at um some of the work that's going to be part of the decriminalized futures exhibition coming up um plug at the ica <laughs> in april um i it's it's really really cool what people are doing i mean like you know like 3d um graphics um using sound and kind of like creating immersive spaces to um yeah kind of like create these like visceral moments of what it is to be and, and just like insane visuals of like what what the world can even look like um on like a physical and aesthetic level um yeah. Okay. And Daniel? Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess I mainly come from like a, a, um, a game design slash music slash animation kind of background. Um, and why I think that's important is because um, it's a little like um, the new Spider-Man animation that came out, um, the Miles Morales Spider-Man. And it's like the first time that like a black kid gets to see a black Spider-Man and they go, holy shit, like I can be Spider-Man. It's a bit like that. It's like those moments of like um, just seeing some of this representation and seeing it in these different formats can do a lot, like can really do a lot to say that I deserve a place here. Um, that means like even if that means in the in the movie theaters, in the gallery, just at work, at school, whatever. Um, and so I feel like that's why like art does a really good job at that. It just it's sometimes very quick and consumable uh, in the sense of not that you're consuming a body, but in that you see an image of yourself reflected and you're like, that's me. And so, you know, from that moment that that could be you, um, which is why I'm like so in love when I see like just trans people doing wild stuff like stuff that's really just wild um and that like i don't understand um and that's like no one else understands and i'm saying like great because then you're telling someone else that they can also do the same and they'll do it even harder than you will um and i, I feel i feel like it generates this iterative process so like, again like stepping stones like you can look back and say uh, morgan did this podcast so i'm going to do this podcast you know um you know, you can go back and say, Caleb did this, so I'm gonna do this. Um, and you can just keep going and building. Um, and that's what I just think art is so good at. It's about like referencing the past, saying, look at these people, and then saying, and because they were there, we can put on this. I'm gonna put this crate on. 
Thank you. Um, Cody? Okay. Can, um, can you clarify the question a little bit <laughs> for me? That's a good question because I think the question became several different questions. Um, broadly speaking, um, the ways art or making art can be a practice of experimenting and how do you see this relating to how we create structural change and also how important is being experimental? Oh, oh yeah. Um, uh, Gosh, well, I mean, as as like a creative person, artist, whatever, um, sometimes I struggle with the label artist uh, and someone who um, works very strongly in my communities for like um, social change in a better world. I don't feel like those two practices are separate. I feel like they're different tactics towards the same goal because um, when we create art and when we create um, especially like imaginary worlds and like uh, uh, experiences people can um, interact with, whether they are like experimental or like even like half finished or even just like bad. Sometimes that happens when you're making stuff like we can't create the world that we want to live in that where we, we all get to live lives that are abundant with unless we can imagine them. And so like the process of creating art and creating um, new worlds and things and experimenting is a part of doing that for me. Yeah. Thanks, Corey. And Francesca or Morgan, would you like to add anything to this? Or to that question? Or those questions? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, you know, the thing that I think is really important about experimenting in art is that, at least right now, we live in a culture partially driven by social media algorithms that demands certainty at all times. We have to be 100% certain in what the ideas that we're putting out on Twitter are. We have to be 100% certain in you know, uh, if we're trans, we have to be 100% certain in our uh, gender identity before any doctor will even deal with us. We have to be 100% certain about this. Um, and everything in life we have to be so certain about. And it, um, I think it really causes us to paint ourselves into corners often and to flatten nuance because um, people feel like to be uncertain is not to be real to be uncertain is to be dangerous. And actually I think um, it really behooves us to move more into spaces of uncertainty and to be honest about the times and places where we don't know um, whether or not something is good uh, or bad. Um, and I think that brings us back to abolitionist practice, you know, like. Um, there's no abolitionist who can sit you down and tell you this is exactly how the world should be structured and then we won't need any of these violent systems. We can't tell you that because we've never lived it. So we have to move from a space of uncertainty being like these are the problems that we have currently and here are some dreams, some possibilities that could change that for the better, right? but we can never guarantee 100% that those things that we're creating won't create their own sets of problems, right, eventually. So I think if we move into more of a space of uncertainty and of being okay with uncertainty, um, it frees up room to change things and to keep in an ongoing practice of change. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. That's beautiful, thanks, Morgan. Um, Francesca, is there anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that I think for me something that art and creative practice and different forms of um, creative expression, what, what they can do is provide a way to sometimes feel and think through feelings in a different way. So I, I when I think about sort of the constant um, news and different types of content and traumatic media that people are exposed to sometimes on a 
I was going to say on a daily hourly basis, but it can be sort of, you know, minute by minute. And, um, you know, for some people that can involve a real form of desensitization that's sometimes partly self-preservationist. And I think there can be a numbness that some sometimes people experience and um, when constantly being confronted by sort of news that that frames the reality of um, the situation that we're living in. And I think sometimes that feelings can really be pushed aside or things can happen to feelings um, that remain unresolved and can, can have a, a really negative impact on, on people mentally and physically. And I think not for everybody perhaps, but for some um, creativity and art can be a way to sometimes reconnect with feelings or to just feel um, or to communicate feelings or experiences and, and different thoughts to other people in ways that sometimes, um, you know, words alone um, or different forms of communication just don't offer. Thank you. Is, is there anything that anybody would like to add to that or we're happy to move on to audience questions? Most exciting part. Not that this hasn't been exciting, but just it's always interesting to see what's come from the conversation. Sorry. Um, yeah, is there anything that anybody would like to ask, uh, add to art and being experimental? No. I think also just to um, echo what Morgan was saying, I think we live and we've lived like in a society that's so like based on the future and being certain in the future and um, that we struggle to to sit with how we are now you know and even thinking in springtime everything will be okay you know by the end of the year everything will be back to normal and it's just like let's just sit like in the discomfort and the discomfort of the uncertainty of we, we don't know and that's okay and I think like even through my art practice and just saying like Corey, like I don't feel comfortable like with that title at all either. Um I think the main thing is just getting something that's in here or in here out of there and into something that can be shared like with other people. Like that I find the hardest task. But once you do that, it's just like okay, like that that is possible. And it doesn't matter if it makes sense or not to anybody else, as long as you know it's communicating how you think or feel or thought about a particular thing. Um okay, so audience questions. We have is art useful as and sorry, just to remind like people that are watching live, you can still ask questions to the panelists um just by clicking on the link, which will take you to a Google form and you can submit your questions. Um, is art useful as a form of retaining memories in case online archives can be hijacked or closed by capitalist organizations bigger than activist movements? Do I need to pick someone or does somebody want to step in? Can you say that again? Please? Yeah, of course. Um, is art useful as a form of retaining memories in case online archives can be hijacked or closed by capitalist organisations bigger than activist movements? So I, I, I might try, try to, to say something about that. Um, but I also think that what I'm trying to say, that pe people have lots of different thoughts on it. But I think sometimes when we think of an archive, we focus on um, a sense of permanence that actually um, th doesn't always necessarily have to be the case. So I'm thinking that even if we're, we're dealing with an archive that's not online, um, sort of a, a sort of tangible um, archive. That doesn't mean that it can't be lost at some point, that it might not disappear. Um, and that's where I think sort of returning to conversations um, with incredible people like Aziza Johnson and, and Mariam Jamila and, and thinking about um, the, the living and embodied nature of archives and, 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 and art and creativity. Um, I think whilst it's definitely important that we work in ways that involves um, you know, documenting and, and tracing and mapping and acknowledging and archiving what has happened before. I think that at the same time, we can recognize that if something material disappears or something that happened online disappears, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the memories do. And in fact, I would definitely say that um, the, the memories themselves are not um, 
solely attached to those sort of tangible or, or physical um, elements that are associated with them. So this might be like a, a, a random rambling example, but I lost about 40,000 photographs last year. Um, and and it, it sort of, it was a pretty existential experience. Um, and I was thinking about which photographs would I miss most? Um, and what would it mean to remember a lot of those different um, moments or people or things that were depicted in the images? And I think that it really led me to rethink about and um, rethink how I understand um, memory work and how I understand what it means to reflect on the past and, and to archive in ways that sometimes doesn't take a tangible form or does for a time and, and then changes or disappears. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to add to that. Like, I feel your pain. Like, I, <laughs> I lost my hard drive and my computer at the same time. Um, so I lost about, I don't know, five years of work. But um, yeah, <laughs> but there was, um, yeah. And then I had like a whole thing about like, right, so these things really aren't, you know, for archiving, they really will be lost. They like data can be lost very easily. Um, but there's something about that also that, um, that I like, that I really like the idea of is like maintain maintenance. And it, it was my fault that I didn't maintain my data in particular. Um, and I love the idea of maintenance and change, that archives can change, that someone can go back into an archive and say, my pronouns have changed, I need to rewrite that section. Um, and I don't think currently that's what like physical archives really let you do, but an online archive really does allow you to do that, which is why it's uh, I, I find them that there's such a nice uh, kind of way of, of archiving, um, especially because it's very easy to update, very easy for everyone to access and very easy to change. Um, and in terms of the non-permanence of online archives, um, yeah, I, I really find that is a scary thing. I, I find that as a scary, like if you try and find all the trans people on my uh, MySpace, they're all gone because uh, the servers are no longer up. Um, and so for me, I've, I, I've been thinking more and more about how we could make um, servers for us, how you can run local servers to store things. Um, and what that necessarily means um, to have the admin behind it, the people doing the work to keep those servers afloat, the same kind of people that are using the technology. Um, and it, it's because the, in the past they used to do this thing when the, they used to play these video games called MUDs. Essentially they were computers in, in a room that were connected and they could record stuff on them. Um, by typing and all this stuff. But it meant that they were very localized servers and you couldn't really get in and extract things. Um, but And it wasn't a very wide wide scope, but it meant that there was like a very good kind of archiving of those moments um, and sharing between those um, computers, um, essentially at the wide web, but just in the room. Um, and those are something that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of like creating our own networks for these things to happen, because we can make our own websites, but even that the code hasn't been written for us to understand. Um, yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Morgan, is there anything that you would like to add to this? Yeah, I mean, um, the one part of this uh, question that I pick up on the most is around um, uh, the capitalist organizations who are running the um, social media where we're doing a lot of our work and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think about, and this really ages me, um, but I think a lot about LiveJournal and how LiveJournal got, which was like a pre-Facebook form of social media, which was, in my opinion, the greatest form of social media ever made because you could like <laughs> very highly lock your privacy settings and just like long form life cast. It was real good. But um, <laughs> LiveJournal got bought out by a Russian company and then purged everything LGBT related. Um, and so I'm really hyper conscious of like these archives that my friends made who are now dead are completely gone because a particular corporation bought that form of social media and then brought in laws from a really repressive regime um, that had that effect, right? So I think part of that goes back to what Danielle was talking about around maintaining our data and actually stopping as things are happening and thinking, how can I hold on to this in a way 
that doesn't rely on this company existing forever. Like we have this really bizarre idea that um, uh, Silicon Valley has like instilled in us recently that like Facebook's too big to fall and Instagram will be around forever. If, no, it won't. Um, Facebook will fall eventually, right? So um, I think that kind of behooves us to think, how can I store something on a separate server like Danielle was talking about or print it out or bring it into the real world or onto a different drive or something like that um, and like start to curate the present for the future, if you know what I mean. So that's what I think about. <laughs> Amazing. And I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move on to the next question and ask maybe if Corey and Caleb can step in on it. Um, so we have, I'm really interested in the way technology and surveillance has come up a few times, even the way in which visibility can be a type of heightened surveillance of certain identities. What do you think about how we navigate surveillance or claim, reclaim technology? Oh, which ties into the last couple of points made. I don't trust the internet. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I, I, it's something I think about a lot. I think we have become quite comfortable um, with our show, social media platforms and kind of like, I guess like an expectation that whatever we put out won't necessarily like come back to haunt or harm us. Um, but then it's also weird as well. Like I've been mean, coming also from like the perspective of a sex worker. I'm like, I think I expect at this point, like anything that I share to be able to be accessed in a lot of ways. Um, it makes me think about, I guess like, yeah, access to my body and like, who who I let in and who I don't let in and how much control I actually have over that. Um, yeah, and I and I also I also just wanted to quickly comment on the the last question as well. Like it makes me like losing data and like all of these things. There's just like data and information and who controls it and who doesn't control it really makes me also think of like ghosts and like maybe I'm being like <laughs> really mad out here. Um, but it like um, Tony, Tony Morrison has this concept of like rememory. Like even when something disappears, it, it always exists. Like the taste of it, the sound of it, the feeling of it is always there no matter who tries to destroy it. Um, so I think with like digital data and technology, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, it's always there. And regardless of like what we think we're sharing, um, we, we don't necessarily have control over it, but also to a degree, we have control over how those narratives are like passed down, like through oral, oral narratives, for example. Um, yeah. So it was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of thoughts. <laughs> and you joined them up beautifully. <laughs> um, there is actually a question um, directly for Cody. So I don't know if you want to come in on the last question um, or if you want to ask, answer the one that's for you. I'm curious about the one that is for me, <laughs> but I also have a lot of thoughts about surveillance on the internet. So Maybe we can know. blend. Oh, I whatever think whatever you, you feel. Um, so good. we'll ask you the one that's for you and then see how you want to answer either or or none. Um, I think Cody's mentioned a couple of times about more international solidarity work. And I'd like to hear more about um, and. There's a little bit more if others in the panel have experience with international trans solidarity or building queer community across borders. That's a, that's a big question. Um, and it deserves a big answer, but I don't have a big answer. Most of my um, experience with international solidarity has been um, by meeting people from other countries or being in other countries and having personal connections with them. Um, a question of like larger 
like international solidarity between like trans folks and sex workers and whatnot, I feel like is uh, something that I would love to talk about in the future with people, if people are interested in that. So I'll just leave that open. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention, say a couple of things about like internet surveillance. That's that's like a huge, also another huge, huge topic, uh, especially when you're talking about um, trans people and, and sex workers um, and the way that we interact with um, with the internet in general. Like, and then especially when you're talking about sex workers um, in the US, um, because the US has very, very, very repressive laws around sex work and what you can, how you're supposed to interact and exist online as a sex worker. Um, like at this point, like, uh, I feel like being online, if it wasn't before, it is now like a complex performance um, uh, as far as like trying to assess who is looking at what you're putting out there, um, how you want it to be received, um, if you're breaking any laws, um, if you need to communicate with other people about breaking laws, either in the country that you're in or the country that they're in, or like even in the case of the US, some states have different laws. Um, so if you're communicating across state lines on occasionally, you could be breaking a law about any number of things. Um, and uh, also, I'm gonna, I've just started rambling a lot here, I'm sorry. But like the question of internet um, surveillance is not just uh, with like, are the are the various um, like internet companies surveilling you? Like it's also like uh, about like law jurisdiction and like all sorts of different things and like how like different amounts of like what categories you fall into if you're vulnerable or not. And uh, anyway, I would love to talk for like hours and hours and hours about performance and and sex work and trans people and internet. Um, surveillance, but I won't, so I'm going to shut up now. Thank you, Cody. Um, we haven't had a chance to answer all the questions, but hopefully um, some of the answers have surfaced in some of the discussions that we've actually had like this evening. Um, but we're going to end with one of the questions that came through, and it's, I know, and call on all the speakers um, to give a little answer or chime in with any last thoughts on this point. Um, I know right now the future is very uncertain, but what kind of things do you hope and dream about for yourself, your communities, your art in the next year, five years or more? It's another big question. Um, and maybe we'll go to Francesca first. I'll keep my answer short and I, and I mean it this time, um, but it would be I, the redistribution of resources and more rest and care and time for people to spend it exactly as they'd like to and to be their, their, their full selves in, in whatever way they want to without fearing um, risks in terms of their safety. Thank you. And Caleb? Um, at the moment, I'm working with a friend on um, trying to actually open up a Black trans radical space. So I hope that that, um, I don't know, sets the standard and we're just like surrounded by loads of Black trans owned radical spaces and land projects that we can visit um, all over the world and commune and yeah, talk about how to like fuck shit up. <laughs> and definitely fuck shit up, we shall. Um... Daniel? Um, whew, that's, a, that's a hard one, but... Um, the, okay, I'm just gonna say some random stuff. Like, um, I wanna see more trans people in apartments by themselves, um, having that kind of space. Um, I, it's, I find it very hard to find a trans person who has their own apartment and that's something that I think is really nice for them because um, we actually don't have, often get the space by ourselves and to learn what that even means. Um, 
I'd love us to, again, like have more spaces like Caleb is talking about, have more black trans centric spaces that exist for long term and you can visit in the day and night. Um, I love more um, social clubs for people above the age of 20 um, so that there's places that we can actually hang out. Um, and it's not just at home. Um, for myself, I guess I would love to somehow, um, I don't know, I'd, I'd, I always dream of having like a big black trans team and we all work on a project together and everyone has a, has a job for a year and it's for certain. So we have a constant salary and so we have that security. Um, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. And Cody? Um, I was, uh, so like we're just talking about what, our, what we want for our futures in like the short term. Am I paraphrasing correctly? Um, awesome. <laughs> um, gosh, um, I would love to make more art and make more art with other trans people and I would love for um, the laws where I live to change so uh, sex worker sex work is no longer criminalized um, so that's caused a lot of harm for a lot of people um, I would love to see more of my people it safe in houses and being able to support themselves financially um, yeah and I would, yeah all of that. Thank you. And Morgan? Um, the bit that I picked up on in your question was like in a year to five years. And, you know, as a historian, I just really desperately want this moment in history to be done. Mm -hmm. um, like I've really, <laughs> I think like many people, I've kind of had it with the past uh, decade. Um, and I'm really ready for us both locally and globally to close this chapter and start something new. Um, hopefully taking the good bits <laughs> and leaving behind like full fascism. Um, so yeah, for me, it's all about like, if this could come to an end in like the next year or so, that'd be great. And then hopefully something better can arise. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, okay, so that's all the questions. Are there any final thoughts, comments, um, projects that people are working on that you would just, anything, a um, couple of minutes to to share some final thoughts. And don't make me pick anyone, please. I just want to say that you all are amazing and I'm really grateful to be on this panel with you. <laughs>
underground left work happening because of the internet and now we're seeing the resurgence of the the right wing and all the they're having the same panels by the way so like we're seeing all of that happen now um and i'm hoping that we can quash that or that can be quashed oh, and that that doesn't become like the status quo and the norm the, the new norm um so I'm hoping just like COVID, that pandemic dies, goes away and leaves us forever and can be just gone. Your final chance for final words. And we're on time. Okay. Well, in that case, I will wrap up then um, and just say thank you to everyone for coming um, in whatever way you were able to come. Um, I hope you've enjoyed tonight's event. We'll be sending out a list of the various resources and groups mentioned throughout the call to everyone who registered for this event. And all the recordings of the events from the series will be available on the Decriminalised Futures website in the next month or so, along with transcripts and resources. That link is decriminalisedfutures.org and you can go to their website and join their mailing list in order to get more updates for when it's all available. Because this is the final event in the series, we want to do some brief shout outs to everyone behind the scenes who made these events possible. It's a collective project to programme, design and organise these events. And thank you to all the speakers who spoke tonight. Um, so that's thank you to Danielle, Caleb, Corey, Francesca. Um, uh, have I thanked Morgan? Sorry, <laughs> I, was just, I knew, I knew it. Um, I was doing too well. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you all for speaking tonight, and thanks to everyone who also has, has spoken in the past three weeks, and thanks to everyone who was involved in running the technical aspects of these events, either on the night or in the days and nights leading up to the events. We also want to say thank you to everyone who came along to watch these events um, live. We understand that, you know, it's, it's a lot to ask um, to sit in front of a screen for two hours, but we hope that you've enjoyed it. And thank you also for sharing your questions and thoughts in the discussion and hope that it's helped inform your knowledges and, you know, your experience. Thank you, especially to all the all those abolitionists out there who put in the work, who take the time and who are willing to believe we can build a different world. Um, so it's good night from me. And I don't know if everybody else would like to say good night too. Bye night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>